Um, 20 years ago, I wrote my first code lines in Java. Coming from a functional perspective, being a functional programmer at the time, I found it a little bit hard to, to wrap all those nice ideas I thought I had and get them into Java, bearing in mind like a functional ideas. And now, some 20 years later, finally we have a language which has actually incorporated support for some of those idioms. However, it's still a little bit tricky. What do you do pragmatically to actually get those things into your code? So from a personal perspective, I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Raoul Gabriel Urma and Richard Warburton, who's going to enlighten us a little bit on the pragmatic functional refactorings using Java 8. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning. Um, that, that is not loud enough. Let's do it again. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Thanks. Um, and that's, that's, that's the extent of the Swedish in this talk. <laughs> English from here on in. And tack. tack. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and as mentioned, uh, Raul and I are going to talk a little bit about kind of pragmatic functional programming um, and how you can take some of the ideas from functional programming and use them with Java 8. So what do we mean by that? Well, a lot of people historically have this kind of view of functional programming that it's an academic endeavor, that there's a kind of inevitability that you'll look like this very sad and unhappy man if you start doing some kind of functional programming. Uh, and we, we want to kind of uh, undermine this perception. We want to, you know, uh, give more of a perception that you can be a regular day-to-day -day developer uh, doing productive, useful things, taking some of those ideas from functional programming. So we're going to kind of take a few of those ideas today and just show you how you can apply them and how you can use them to, you know, get, make less bugs and make ne ne neater, more readable code. Um, but non nonetheless, Take a quick look at your neighbor in the room. If he's got a beard, then he's probably a functional programmer. So be, be careful, be careful. Yeah, or, or a heavy metal fan. It could be, it could be either way. It could be either way. So uh, what are the ideas that we kind of picked to talk about? So the first thing is first class functions. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little about currying. Um, and then we're going to talk about immutability, and then we're going to talk about the optional data type, which was introduced in Java, and then we're going to wrap some of these themes up and talk about how you can use them. So, Raul, first class functions, what are they? Fantastic. So first class function is one of those terminology, so it's good to have it in pocket for important dinners, so we're going to shed some light around that. So, Richard, you're going to be my customer today. Okay. And I'm going to build some software for him. So Richard is going to have a lot of new requirements coming in and so on. So we'll see how that works out. I can see you've got your software engineering hat on there as well. Fantastic, it's fantastic. It's also very cold in Sweden, so I'm prepared. <laughs> so so uh, this, this hypothetical customer who's come along has achieved the near impossible. We've managed to get some money out of Oracle. Okay? That's impressive. So it, very impressive, very impressive. So uh, here we go. I want you to give me do, me, do me a task now. We've got some management reporting to do, Raul. How can we find those invoices which we want to send to Oracle? How can we get some money related to Oracle? Okay, Richard. Well, let's do this quite straightforwardly. So let's create a method. Let's call it, you know, something nice and easy. Find invoices from Oracle. We take those list of invoices. Then the first thing we do is to create a sort of accumulator object where we can store each invoice from Oracle step by step. So we iterate through the whole invoices, we check that the customer is Oracle, if yes, we add it to Accumulator, we do that iteratively until we're done, and finally, we can return the list of invoices from Oracle. Fantastic. And as you would expect, it turns out to not be as much money as we thought we got out of Oracle to begin with. Um, okay, but well, one more thing, one more thing, Raul. What about other customers? We've got some other customers. How are we going to find out about them? Ah, those customers, huh? Very, sometimes very annoying with those requirement changes. So, okay, fair enough. So, I can understand that the customer is going to be changing, so maybe there'll be different companies. So, let's refactor our method so it's parameterized with a customer. So, we add a new parameter here. We refactor our code, so mainly the condition here in the middle, so it reuses the parameter passes an argument to do the check on the customer. 
And with this, I can call for any requirement changes that involves the customer. So I can charge Richard twice as much. Fantastic, fantastic. One more thing, one more thing though. Uh, we got, we're doing kind of different types of work. So some of what we do is training, some of it might be other things. How can we find the invoices related to training work? I see, so now not only you want to be able to find invoices by customer, but you like to find maybe based on the suffix of the invoice's name. So you could filter out from training, from consulting and so on. Mm -hmm. So I can bet that's gonna change as well quite frequently. So, you know, let's just copy paste the method from before. You know, that's nice and easy. We'll refactor it to in introduce a different parameter, the suffix here, and Again, we trade to all those invoices and we change the condition in the middle. So this is fantastic. I can filter by the suffix as well. So one more thing here, Al. This this copy and pasting technique that you're talking about. Yeah. Is this software engineering best practice? Is this what we should be doing? Is, it, is that what? But you're yeah. wearing the hat. You tell me. Yeah, but I see you're paying me for the number of lines of code I'm writing. So, you know. <laughs> but fair, 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 fair enough. Fair enough. So. What can we do? Hmm. What can we do? What can we do? Do not do this. <laughs> right? Um, so, presumably, you're not going to be too happy with this. It doesn't look very much like the things I was talking about. I was talking about like finding invoices to do with customers or suffixes, and there's, this doesn't look at all like the kind of the business problem statements I was giving you earlier. That, that's true, and on top of that, this solution doesn't really scale. I'm sure you're going to have a hundred different uh, properties of the invoice you might want to filter on. Mm. So it's not like I can maintain this one method with a hundred parameters and this sort of switch. This is a nightmare for maintenance as well. So let's take a step back, Richard. Okay. So here comes the software engineering hat. Let's see what we can do. So really what we'd like to do is to model the condition that is applied on each invoice. So here we introduce an interface called predicate. And from English, predicate is something that returns a boolean. So we've got a predicate interface here with a type parameter T, you know, just in case there'll be other things than invoices. And this has a method called test, takes this object type T and turns a boolean. So now I'm able to model that condition. This is really great. So how can we apply this in our code base now? Well, let's refactor our find invoice method. Instead of introducing all those parameters, what we're going to introduce now is this sort of predicate object, this condition, as a parameter. And we can update the condition in the middle now to test each invoice based on that. But we're not quite done yet, right? So we've got this nice method now. We can reuse the same code, but how do we actually use it? Well, Java lets us do this, so we can declare a class that implements an interface. So for Richard, Maybe you're interested in finding invoices related to training with Facebook. Well, here we implement the predicate. We give the test invoice method. Here and the body here says, well, the customer is Facebook and it's related to training. So now I can instantiate that class and we're done. But Raul, this, this kind of these lines here, aren't you going to have to write them out every time? Aren't you, are you, are you still advocating that copy and paste programming technique? Well, okay, he's a, he's a tough customer. He's a tough customer. So let's see if we can uh, improve this one step further. So here, here's where Java 8 comes in again. So let's, let's say we had a 2 2 method, one called is Oracle invoice. So that's just going to check whether an invoice is related to Oracle. And the other one that will check whether the invoice is related to training. Then using Java 8 and the method reference syntax, you can just do that. So here we've got colon colon. So this is saying, well, I like the existing method defined in the enclosing class called is Oracle invoice, and I'd like to pass it as an argument to find invoices. So this is very different to calling a method. We're taking that method and saying, pass it as an argument to find invoices. So our code is looking already less verbose. I'm making less money, but I guess you're happier. Yep, yep. Yes. So there's another step that we can do. So you know, those method references here are great because we can get the name of them, so we can use that in our code base. It makes our code more readable. 
But if we had those little throwaway methods that we're actually only using once, then there's something else we can do with Java 8. We can use lambda expressions. So the syntax for lambda expression, you can see there's something different here, like an arrow. But in a nutshell, we've got this parameter here, which is the invoice. And we can omit the type, because the compiler now is smart enough to infer that what you want is an invoice, just based on the context. And we're just implementing the body of the method, like we were doing previously. And you can see that this sort of a trick is working, because the structure of that lambda expression matches the structure of the predicate interface that we had earlier. And this is how this stuff works uh, under the hood. So to wrap up this idea, so what you've just seen here is that your first class functions, which is terminology from function programming. It just means here's a, a function available to us, a method, and we'd just like to pass it as an argument to another method or even store it in a variable. That is all it is. And it turns out, in object-oriented programming, we make use of this pattern all the time. But we just revamped it with really clean, simple syntax. Skin syntax and fancy design patterns. So we call it sometimes the strategy design pattern. We might sometimes call it command well, design pattern. pattern. Actually, they're all very, doing very similar things. They're just about representing a function and being able to pass it around. That's all it is. And the, the, the bottom line is, this helps us cope for requirement changes when the requirement can be represented as a function. And now Richard is happy. Fantastic. I'm loving it. Lego. Who's a fan of Lego? Everyone's a fan of Lego. It's almost a requirement to be a software developer, right? You've got to have played with Lego as a kid. And what you really want to do with Lego is take these kind of little small blocks and put them together to create something more interesting like this fantastically artistic horse we've got on the slide here. <laughs> so let's, let's tell us about composing functions, Raul. Yeah, I'm actually wondering how, how is that horse fitting because there's like two separate pieces here. I'm just... <laughs> oh, well. There's some dark magic here. Some dark Lego magic. Gravity, you have been defeated. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Lego blocks and functions. So the analogy here is that you can see a function as one Lego piece and composing function is about putting those pieces together to really create richer functions. And that's what we're going to look at. So here's a carry on on this example of uh, those invoices that we'd like to, to filter on. Let's say we already have this sort of predicate that tells me, well, an invoice is related to Facebook, and I've got a separate one that tells me this invoice is related to training. If I'd like a new one that was saying Facebook and training, would I really have to define a separate method that really copy pastes this code again? Well, we can do something better. So we can actually compose them to create a new one so by reusing them. And in Java 8, yeah? So you've got these kind of and and or methods here on the, on, on the predicates. Where are they coming from? Is that, is that magic or is that just regular code or what's going on? I'm glad you asked. Fantastic. I'm glad you asked. So, yeah, where are they coming from? Well, it turns out in Java 8, there's a new neat feature called default methods, which allows you to have implementation code inside interfaces. So, let's revisit the old predicate interface. And this code is taken from, you know, more or less from the Java 8 code base. So, we're not making it up. It's how it looks like in real. So we've got a, an abstract method, so a single abstract method here, called test, takes some of type t and turns a boolean. And that's great because that really represents the signature of the function. But then we get those two new cool guys here, and you can see that they're a bit different to traditional methods because they've got this keyword here called default. And that just enables us to have a default implementation inside the interface. And we're saying, well, I am a predicate myself, and I'd like to take another predicate as an argument. So how do we compose each other's? Well, we're going to return a new function. So here are lambda expressions to represent a function that takes the object of type t, in this case the invoice. The first thing we do is we, we test ourselves, the predicate, so using the test method. And then we're going to chain ourselves with the predicate passes an argument. And this also supports a test method. So this is how the trick works. And with the or operator, we can do something similar. Does that shed light on your, on your question, Richard? Yeah, it's really nice and simple. Very nice and simple, friendly, and allows us to do composition. And here's another example. So we're going to look at pipe pipelines. 
Very Fantastic. trendy word, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, yeah. Although pipelines themselves are one of these concepts which has been around for a while. Anyone done sh loads of shell programming before, like bash? That kind of thing, yeah, where you end up having these situations where you take little individual kind of Unix commands like grep and cut and cat and put them together to form a computation pipeline by piping the results out of one into the other. Is that the kind of thing you mean? Exactly, precisely. So let's look how we can apply this sort of a general pattern with Java 8. So Java 8 put, updates the API to make that one step easier. So the example we've got here is, let's say we've got an email. So an email has a message, and we like to be able to process this, this email with various um, functionalities. For example, we'd like to add a default header to the email sometimes. We may want to do some check spelling. We may want to add a footer. So for those of note, what we're going to try and do here is something similar to the chain of responsibility pattern, where you take this input, and you might want to apply multiple different functionality on top of them. So visually, we could represent this as follows. So I'd like to create a pipeline that does the add header, the spelling, and the footer. Well, in Java 8, this, this, uh, here we're using a method reference for the add header. And this can be represented as a function which takes as an input an email, and it's going to produce another email as a result. Right? But the email will be slightly richer, because it'll have the header on top of it. Well, it turns out the function interface supports this method called and then, which takes another function as an argument. And what that's going to do is going to take the input of one, produce an output, and the output becomes the input of the next function, and so on. And that's how we can build those rich pipelines. So, so one of the advantages here is that we can choose a different set of functions to build our pipeline out of, right? We couldn't just do, we could do check spelling, but we could also have a check Swedish spelling, or we could have a check spelling for managers, which ensures there's a certain number of buzzwords in the email and, and doesn't let it go out of it if it doesn't pass that criteria, right? Exactly. And pipeline is one of those words that you should have in your email. To Vocabulary, your yeah. So, and the, the other benefit is that we can reuse this function that we've defined, right, and just mix and match instead of having to duplicate code and maintain separate components. So another example, if we'd like a simpler pipeline, well, let's just reuse those components and put them together. So here, again, we've got the add header, but I'd just like to add a signature so to, by skipping the check spelling. And we can do this as simple as that by using method references. Fantastic. So that was it for first class functions. So again, that's the idea of passing a function as an argument to an, an, another function or method. Um, composing function is even more interesting because that produces another function as a result. So those are all patterns that are now available to us in Java 8. And we're going to look on how to take that one level further with currying, Richard. Yeah, currying. So before we talk about currying, let's think about some kind of simple example conversion function. So suppose you're trying to convert between two different units which have a linear relationship between each other. We might want to take the amount in one unit, multiply by a kind of factor or ratio between them, and add a base, you know, good old y equals mx plus c stuff. Uh, so for example, for converting between Fahrenheit and Celsius, we might want to use a ratio of 1.8 and a base of 32. Okay? So, okay, that looks fantastic, but how, how can I reuse this function now with different sort of units? Okay, so what we want to be able to do is do things like uh, convert between temperatures, between Celsius and, and Celsius and Fahrenheit. Uh, we might want to convert between currencies. Uh, obviously, using a fixed conversion rate of 0 0.6 is probably not exactly what you want to do at every point in time, but, you know, the financial crisis must have been started by something like this, so... Yep, <laughs> it does happen. Uh, or there's something like, say, kilometers to miles, where, uh, again, they both hit zero as, as they're, they're both zero at the same point, but uh, you have a ratio of 0 0.62. So there's lots of different things we can do there. So we all know that kilometers is the better unit. <laughs> than miles. Even though, even yeah. though we both live in England. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay, Richard, so that seems quite, quite, quite neat. But um, so if I want to, this example of Celsius to Fahrenheit is fairly interesting because if I want to reconvert another unit from Celsius to Fahrenheit, does that mean I really have to plug in those values every time, 1.8 and 32? That sounds like you're trying to charge me now for the lines of code, huh? What's going on here? <laughs> um, so uh, we, 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 we can do better than this. 
And in order to do so, uh, we need to think about what we need to take a step back and think about the different things we're doing. What we want to think about is being able to reuse code. So how can we take that conversion function and reuse the conversion function in different places, but with uh, a common set of parameters? And we also need to think about how we can write something that abstracts and, and works over different conversion functions. So in order to achieve these kind of goals, uh, we need to introduce a new concept. Uh, which is curry. So uh, my favorite type of curry is uh, the tarly. Who's, who's a fan of curry in the room? Some people. Curry not that big in Sweden. Okay. Uh, well, the tarly is like my favorite type of curry because it's a curry where you've got lots of like different types of dishes of all sorts of different things and you get to try a few different bits and bobs. And that's what currying is really about. It's about taking a big monolithic function that needs to take all of its arguments in one go and splitting it down into little functions which each take one argument and then return another function. I love how you... When you have a curry, you need to have some Coke and some presumably Fanta hair. It seems like <laughs> to the Yeah, yeah. Um, so how can we do this with our conversion function? Uh, well, uh, instead of writing our conversion function in a way that takes all three arguments, we're going to just take the factor and the base, and then we're going to return a new function that is uh, returning a double unary operator. So that means a function that takes a double as an argument and returns a double back to you. Um, so in Java 8, there's been no actual added support or built-in uh, currying syntax, but we can write functions in a kind of curried style, so taking some arguments and returning another function, and that's what, that's what we're doing here. So some languages like Scala and Haskell would have this support, but here we're doing that manually. Yeah. Um, so when we want to use it, we've got our conversion function, and we can convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit by plugging in the arguments, and then we've got our double unary operator back, and we can use that by just calling the appliers double method with the value we want to convert from, and the result that we get out is the converted value. But makes sense? It, it, it sort of makes sense, but what's this double unary operator about? Because I'm, I haven't seen that before. So that's a functional interface role. So that's an interface with a single abstract method that you'd use as the uh, inferred type for a lambda expression or a method reference. And that's part of the built-in Java 8 API? Yes, Fantastic. yes. Fantastic. Um, so we kind of say, why are we actually going to do this? Well, it's the, the point of having curry is so you can eat it. They don't look very happy. No, these guys are eating curry completely wrong. Uh, for a start, they've got a lot of wine, and secondly, they're not very happy at all. But importantly, they are eating curry, and that's the other thing that you can do once you've curried your functions. You can engage in some partial application. And partial application is a step where you take that function and you apply some of the arguments, but not all of them, and that gives you another function back. Okay? So what does that look like in code? Well, here our conversion function is going to take some arguments of uh, the uh, ratio and base for temperatures, for money, and also for kilometers and miles here. So in all these cases, we've applied some of the arguments, but not all of them, and we've got a function back as a result, which we can then use. So I've got two questions, Richard. So the first one, well, it's OK. So now every time I want to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, it means I don't have to plug in those values every time. Yep. I can reuse those functions that are provided to us. So it seems like carrying and partial application is a sort of factory design pattern that produces new functions for us. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's one way of thinking about it. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. And the second question is, what does dollars and pounds in the name of the convert dollars to pound variable here? What, what's that about? Well, those are valid. Those, that's valid identifiers, as long as it's not the first character. <laughs> re re recent feature, isn't it? Java 7? Yeah, yeah, they did add that in Java 7. Fantastic. Cool. Uh, so, we've talked about the idea that you can take existing functions and you can kind of write them in a curried style. But actually, a lot of other languages, as we said, had syntactic support for uh, curried functions out of the box. So we want to actually be able to write a function that takes another function and curries it. Um, and uh, to save, to simplify the generics a little bit, what we've done here is provided an example curry function that's specific to ints. But you can replace ints with a generic type if you want. 
Uh, so what this is doing is it's taking an int binary operator, so that's a function that takes two int arguments and returns an int value, and then it's splitting that by function up and returning a function that returns another function. So it's got its first argument, which is an int, and then that returns another function, and that's got one argument that's also an int, and then that applies the function, now it's got all, collected all its arguments up, by just delegating to the original function. So how can we use that? Good question. Conveniently, the next slide answers it. So here's an example of an int binary function that adds two numbers together. And as you can see here, we've got the apply to begin with, which, uh, which provides the first argument. And then that, could, that function that we've got returned there at that point in time could be passed around or used by in other places. And then we can apply the second argument separately like this. And obviously, 1 plus 2 is 3. So it does all make sense. Great. Uh, so, where would you use the, uh, the, the currying approach and partial application role? Well, it sounds like it's a pattern that's useful for combinators libraries. For example, with parsers, when you like to have a token and maybe repeatedly be able to, to parse that chain. Is that an example of currying possible? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, or some people as well I've seen use it for kind of HTML templating where you have something which can be built up repeatedly in a template and then you take another function that generates the element and partially apply it and then you can do something like plop in the actual value right at the end and then hey presto you've got some HTML. That sounds very related to the builder pattern in Java isn't it where you kind of build up your sort of function with different arguments until you get a final object back. Yeah there's definitely a conceptual link between those two things. Um, cool. So, just to recap on that section, currying is about taking a function and splitting up your argument list and being able to apply the arguments one by one. And partial application is the actual eating of that curried function one step at a time and providing each argument and getting another function back. Cool. cool. So you were mentioning something earlier about immutability. What's, what's up with immutability? Yeah, so immutability is another topic very fundamental to functional programming, which we'll have a look in a moment. So, who takes the train regularly in this room, out of curiosity? Okay, keep your hands up. Who has taken the train in UK before? Who enjoys UK trains? Exactly. Oh, there's one person over there. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> One so, guy likes UK trains. Okay, fantastic. You'll have to explain to us why afterwards. Because <laughs> in UK, you know, if it snows a little bit, the whole country shuts down, including the trains and the airport. But it's always amazing that in Sweden, you know, there can be like snow, crazy minus 20 degrees. Yeah. It's all fine. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about trains and how UK trains are not that great. <laughs> so they're mutable. And we'll talk about immutability to discuss that. So let's say we've got a, we'd like to model a train journey. So a train journey has a price and an onward journey. So here's an example of a mutable class. So that means once we've instantiated the train journey, so we get this object back, we're able to change it, right? So I'm able to change its price, I'm able to change the onward journey, so I can mutate its state. That's the terminology for it. So is there a downside to that, Richard? If we had the yeah, definitely. Um, it sounds like you could take that object and pass it around to another block of code and update the same object and change the behavior of that other unrelated code. Can, can we, is that something that could happen? Precisely. So let's suppose I've got a train journey from Stockholm to Gothenburg and Gothenburg to another place. If I give that to you over there and went to you over there, you could be cheeky and change the price of his ticket, right? Because you own it. So that not may be something that you don't want. So what's the alternative? So the alternative is called immutability. So we can make use of immutable objects. And that's the general idea that once you've instantiated this object, you cannot change its state anymore. If you like to introduce a change, you'll have to get a new object back from it. So the way we do this in Java typically, we'll make the class final to prevent extensions to it. We'll make the fields um, final, so we kind of reassign to those fields. Any sort of setters here, let's say we'd like to update the price, we'll create a new object by providing this updated value, so the price, and uh, similar for the onward journey. 
But there's an important trick to remember, is that it's not just enough to have final fields, right? We need to make sure that the type of the field itself is immutable. So typically, if you've got an array, for example, as a field, even though you can't reassign to the field, you can st still change the elements within that array, because the array itself is mutable. So this sort of immutability needs to be done transitively, right? So it needs to cascade down to all the classes. So that's something to keep in mind. So what are we going to do? Well, let's take some small journeys and make long journeys out of them for scenarios where in the UK where the train breaks down and you need to get on another train. Let's see, let's see what options we have. In the UK, when a journey goes down, we need to change journeys all the time. <laughs> so let's see how we can implement that. So we'll use some diagrams to explain the concepts and then we'll show some code on how to implement it. So the first strategy is what we'd call a destructive link. So that's the idea, once we've got two journeys, how can we produce a new one? Well, let's mutate the first one so it points to the second one. So we actually ch change the state of the first journey. And this is what this diagram here depicts. We call the link method here, that takes the start in the continuation journey, and that will mutate the first journey to point to the second one. So how would we implement this? Well, here's a, an implementation. We take the start journey, the continuation journey. The first argument is no, we just return its tail or the continuation here. Then we like to find the final stop, right, of the, of the start journey. And null here will, will define the end of the, of the journey, right? So we loop, we find the, the, the last stop, and then when we have it, we can set the last stop to carry on with the continuation journey. So it's a bit like adding an element to a linked list? That's what this code is doing. We trade the linked list, and then at the end, we add the tail. Fantastic. So this is fine, but um, there is a very deep problem with this approach. You know, if we take a start journey and a continuation journey, we provide that result to one of a customer, another customer comes in and is like, hey, I'd like to do a similar sort of a calculation, take the start journey and the condition journey. Presumably, we like the same result back, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, let's test that out. Let's see what happens. So here we've got a, this sort of visit helper method, which will just, you know, recursively stretch through all the journey and maybe print its price, okay? So, when we run this code, we'll get a surprising Stack Overflow error. And that's very nasty. So why is the Stack Overflow error happening? So, the Stack Overflow is happening because our code here is looping recursively forever and then the stack blows up. But why is that going forever? So, let's see step by step what's going on with our code. So, we start, we've got a start journey, the continuation journey, fantastic. Let's link them up together. So we mutate the state of the start journey to point to the continuation journey. So far, so good. Unfortunately, when we have the second call to link, start, the start journey object is different, right? It's not the same one as previously because we mutated its state. So the start journey now carries on until the continuation. And once we've reached this, we're saying, well, we like to append that back to the continuation journey. So that creates a cycle. And this is why recursively we'll be printing the price, printing the price, and then boom. Stack overflow. Yeah. So the bottom line here, the, 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 tic, the takeaway is that mutability can introduce really subtle bugs. They're really hard to find. So let's see what we can do about it. So here's a different approach. Functional style of programming says, well, let's not mutate stuff around. You know, we need to be careful for our customers, for our users in the client code. They don't expect things to be changing. So let's create a copy of the start journey and we'll just link that with the continuation journey. And this way, the first call and the second call are completely independent. And here's a sort of concise way to implement this if we'd like to, to do an append. So we make use of recursion as well, but we're just appending the onward journey recursively. So 
So immutability isn't something that's purely in existence from a functional programming side of things. Um, a lot of the people from the domain-driven design side of things are advocating that a lot of their value classes are immutable. Uh, and that means you can pass things between different systems and not have to worry about the interaction between different systems and keep things decoupled from each other. Core library changes in Java 8 have definitely favored immutability in nature. So there's a new date and time library in Java 8, and that has immutability nearly everywhere, pretty much nearly everywhere. But, but Richard, that's been around since 1990s, isn't it? String class, immutable, integer class, immutable. Exactly. So it's not core, a new concept. Core value types have always been immutable as well. Um, and there's also a bunch of tooling around for helping you figure out if your classes are genuinely immutable and checking that they're immutable. Uh, so the final keyword, as we've mentioned, bans reassignment, so that can be a bit of a help. Um, there's improved annotations in Java 8, which also give you the op opportunity to have better annotation checkers for mutability. And there's a GitHub project called Mutability Detector that will allow you to write tests that assert classes are immutable. And also find bugs will let you warn classes uh, if classes say that they're immutable by annotation but aren't really immutable. So these are quite helpful safety nets for you and your team if you're going down the immutability route. But Richard, we're advocating for immutability here, but like everything, there should be some downsides, right? Yeah, so like any programming practice, there are some downsides to immutability. So for a start, because you're creating lots of new objects, you might have a higher memory allocation rate on your application, you might cause more GC pressure. Another thing you might need to think about with GC, uh, with uh, immutability, is that uh, certain problems are fundamentally harder to model in an immutable environment, and some things just naturally fit to mutability. So something that comes to mind is the idea of a car simulation, where your car is kind of moving around a circuit or something like that. All that car is doing is being moved around. Having those fields be uh, mutable is naturally part of your update on, on, on the cars. Um, sometimes libraries can get in your way. ORMs especially don't really fit well uh, with uh, immutable domain classes. Uh, serialization can be a bit of an issue with some libraries, but some of the serialization libraries are getting better these days. Um, and obviously there are other alternatives. So, for example, you might be able to take your state, split it up into small, simple units, and continue to mutate that state, but in a more restricted and controlled way, so you get a lot of the benefits of immutability without having to go the whole hog. So there's some pragmatism to immutability as well, I think. Definitely, but there's a couple of good news. Chavan 10 and beyond will introduce us value types, so that will be one step further to provide better support for immutability, but also optimize that around. Yeah. Um, and finally, in general, straight off, you know, immutable objects reduce the scope for bugs, and at the end of the day, we'd like to have less bugs in our code base too. So that's something to keep in mind. Fantastic. So, well, it looks like we've got a fourth and final functional program topics, optional data types. What, what is that about, Richard? Well, you know what you really love is the idea that um, you run your application and you get a null pointer exception. Who's, who's had that? happen to them, right, everybody, yeah, yeah. Some and say a true Java programmer doesn't start with a hello world example, but with a null pointer exception example. <laughs> That's the tr trick. <laughs> and can, coincidentally, these kind of errors crop up more likely towards the end of the day, and more likely to happen when you're just about to head off to the pub as well. On a Friday evening, and isn't on it? On a Friday evening, just at the worst time. So we all hate the null pointer exception, and we want to try and remove the scope for null pointer exceptions, and that's where the optional data type comes in. So, uh, let's look at our friend Wally here. So, Wally uh, is a software engineer, um, and unfortunately, Wally had this piece of code which was written for him. He had a, a person, and his person had a car, and he was pulling out of the car an insurance policy, and he was getting the name of the policy holder out of the car, and he had a null pointer exception on this line. And Wally was sitting there for ages trying to figure out where it was. Is it that the person's null? Was it the car? Was it the insurance policy? Where the heck is the NPE? And, you know, Wally got so stressed with debugging this NPE that he's run away from his job and started hiding himself in large crowds of people and very difficult to even find Wally these days, let alone the NPE. So, what could Wally have done? 
Well, the first thing that some people do is excessive amounts of uh, null pointer defensive checking. So, assume everything could be null and defensively check for that null pointer all over your code base. Uh, after a while with this, it's kind of getting a bit ugly, right? It's also a situation where um, a lot of those objects, maybe they aren't null. How do we know whether they're null or not null? What are the options in that space? Yeah, and Richard, it feels like I'm not even sure what this code is doing anymore. Looks like a fancy algorithm with all those nested if conditions and so on. I've kind of lost the meaning of what this mm. message is mm. doing here. So, um, another alternative that we're going to look at is the optional data type. So, uh, Java Util optional was introduced, and you can think of an optional data type as like a, a container, a bit sort of like a collection, but for either a single value or no value whatsoever. And the benefit of using the optional data type in your code is it provides really explicit modeling for when a value may or may not be present. So, if it's always going to be present, leave it as a regular type and never assign null to it, or if it's something which may or may not be present depending on circumstance, you can think about using an optional type. Um, and that gives you by explicitly modeling the problem, it's easier to maintain your code. The other thing it does is it requires you to actively unwrap an optional value. Um, so there's a bunch of different operations, which we'll look at a few of them in a sec, uh, that let you deal with the value in a way that's kind of null safe, and that reduces the number of errors you can get in your code. So that sounds great. So let's see how we can introduce optional in our code base then. So uh, let's take our model classes and update them. So just, just a simplification. Uh, a person may or may not have a car, so that's going to be optional. A car may or may not have an insurance policy. And our insurance, but our insurance policy definitely has a name. So we've got two things which are optional and, and one that isn't. Uh, probably if you end up with this kind of ratio all over your domain classes, you might need to rethink things broader. But, you know, it's just an optional example. Um, and what we can do is we can use the existing functions on optional, like map, which is doing the same thing as the stream uh, map. In other words, you take a function that changes a value to a value, call map with that function on the optional, and it unboxes the optional if it's present, maps it, and reboxes it. Or, if it's not present, it does nothing. It just returns you the absent optional value. So, let's see how we can apply map in this situation. Well, we get our car from the person, and we get the insurance policy from the car, and then we map the insurance policy to a name. Hmm. Unfortunately, just by using map on its own, I'm going to compile error here. Can you help me debug this problem in Raul? Yeah, so that's quite nasty. We get a sort of nested optional. So when we've got those map problems, I think we've got a special friend to call, isn't it, Richard? When I'm in need of a, uh, help, I always look for a Shiba Inu dog. Uh, they're the kind of people that's exactly who... exactly what I had in mind. Fantastic. Yeah. Much... <laughs> you can't quite read it there. Fantastic. So, so much flat map, uh, much optional. Wow. Fantastic. So let's, what's flat map going to do for us, Raul? Well, it sounds like flat map, there's a hint in the, in the method name. It's talking about flat. So presumably, that's something to do with flattening nested optionals? Exactly. So you can map between values, and then when you get a function that returns you an optional, it's going to flatten that down into a single optional, so you don't have the problem with an optional wrapping an optional of a value. So we can refactor our code example and get our car out of our person using flat map, get our insurance policy out of our car using flat map, get the name out of the map, and then we can use this or else to provide a default value. So um, if, if anything's been missing in here, we can just return a value back to the calling function. Um, this code works because the get car here was returning an optional, so yep. we're calling flat map for that. Get insurance was returning an optional of insurance, so that's why we call flat map. But get name here was just returning a string. So this is why we're calling the little brother map. Fantastic. And all those methods are available also in the streams API. So it's a general pattern that already exists in Java 8 that has just been reapplied with optional. And it turns out it's also existing with something else called completable future. So this is quite frequent now. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
one thing we need to think about, though, is uh, that, yeah, the names are exactly the same between uh, the methods in optional and streams, but on completable feature, they are a little bit different, aren't they? they can be, that can be a little bit confusing. Um, one other thing to note is the topic of using optional data types on fields, which is something that's a little bit controversial, something that's appropriate and something that's not appropriate. A lot of people are very happy with using optional data types for return val values, but fields has more of a kind of pro and con trade-off. So pro is that we're explicitly modeling the uh, ability of a value to not be present or be present, and we do get that null safe access, and our getters can just return the optional values. But unfortunately, um, we also get a little bit more indirection and overhead from using optional as field values all over the place. And uh, some libraries don't really understand the optional type yet. Some libraries also require your entities to be serializable, like CDI does this, for example, and optional fields aren't necessarily serializable, so that's a bit problematic. But one of the point on uh, more indirection with optional, hmm. that's something that is being looked at with value types, isn't it? It could potentially fix the problem uh, when it arrives. No. Um, so the key takeaway from this section is consistent use of optional replaces the use of null. So let's wrap up on some conclusions, shall we? Fantastic. So we saw four topics. First class functions. So that's the idea that you can cope for requirement changes by representing the requirement as a function and be able to pass that around to another method or variable. We saw currying. So that's the idea of splitting up the parameters of function into individual parameters. We've seen immutability, so a way to reduce the scope for potential bugs, really, really nasty bugs like the train journey one. And optional data types is a way to, you know, hopefully have less no point to exceptions. So we moving towards happier merge between more academic industry programmers, aren't we? Yeah, Actually. yeah. Hopefully we can be a little bit more like this now, where we take some of the ideas from the academic side of things and use them in a more day-to-day -day setting. I think that's, that, that's where we should be going. Um, and just one more note on that kind of thing. Uh, if you've enjoyed some of the topics that Raoul and I have been talking about yesterday and today on Java 8, we run a full day, two day, tr a full two day training course. Uh, the next local running is in Stockholm. Well, actually there's one running Thursday and Friday this week, but it's sold out. So the next one is running on the 20th and 21st of April in Stockholm. And you can sign up there if you're interested. Uh, Raoul and I also wrote two books on Java 8 if you want a more uh, paperback approach to learning, uh, and both of these are fantastic, and we're happy to recommend both of them. Cool. <laughs> um, so, uh, we've got maybe a minute or two left, so if anyone has any questions, uh, now is a good time to ask them. Hi. One question over here. Sorry, can you shout? I can't quite hear you. Can I? I couldn't hear that. Yes, uh, the, I, let me see if I get the question right. Can you zip together two lists in Can you Java? zip together two lists? Mm. Uh, very good question. Um, the, all the higher order functions in Java 8 operate on streams, which are a kind of abstraction of operating on things rather than directly on lists. There was, for a while, an operation called zip, which would zip together two streams, but the zip actually got removed in the run-up to Java 8. Um, I've mentioned a few times to some people at Oracle that perhaps it could be reintroduced in Java 9, because I think it's a very useful function. Um, in the current absence of zip on streams, though, I think Lucas Eder has a project called Ju Lambda, like J-O-O -O and then the Lambda symbol, and I think he has a zip function that operates on streams there, so you can get it from a third-party library. Is that okay? Uh, hi. Uh, why didn't Java 8 introduce persistent collections? like lists, maps in Scala? That's an interesting question. Uh, so the question was, why didn't uh, Java 8 introduce persistent collections? So a persistent collection is a collection that when you update it, you retain a reference to the old version of the collection, and to other things using the old collection still have that um, 
version of the collection. So there are actually some existing persistent collection implementations in Java. So there's a P collections project. Um, and I think the GS collections library has a uh, immutable set of collections that don't necessarily use the normal persistent collections algorithms, but which copy a new version and return it. Uh, persistent collections are an interesting topic in and of themselves. So one of the things that people kind of ignore is that a lot of the really smart algorithms for implementing persistent collections that just do kind of cheap returns and cheap cheap joins often have other negative side effects performance wise. Uh, so there's still a bit of a kind of um and an ah as to what the actual best way of implementing persistent collections are. There's a few of the kind of like academic publications on here's a nice algorithm don't tend to work that well or cause additional indirection when you're operating on the collection which just screws up your cache prefetcher. So it's not like there's like an ideal perfect way of implementing persistent collections. I think there's probably a lot more research to be done in that way before anyone settles on persistent collections. Anything to add? No, yeah, I, I agree. I Fantastic. think we've got the last question here. Quick okay. One. How do you deal with the checked exceptions in your lambdas? If you want to add a, like a lambda, but you, your method is throwing a checked exception. It's kind of a bit hard from what I... So there's, there's two aspects to that. Firstly, there's how do checked exceptions interact with lambdas. And lambdas are fine with checked exceptions. You can throw uh, checked exceptions from lambdas and that works fine. The other thing is what do you do if your lambda is being assigned to a functional interface and the method that that returns throws a checked exception. Um, and that's the case for a lot of the stream library code where the functional interfaces like uh, predicate, consumer, function, things like that don't throw checked exceptions. Now, my preferences are trying to avoid checked exceptions as much as possible. So if you're calling a method like filter and then it's calling a predicate on your domain class, it wouldn't throw one to begin with. Um, alternatively, what you can do is if you have some code which is checked and you want to move it into an unchecked world, it's very easy to write uh, just a couple of kind of utility classes that wrap up something with a checked exception and uh, return it. Um, if you're in a situation where you've got like a bunch of code that's being managed by a framework and that framework taking callbacks into or via lambdas, so an example is a modern specification and behavioral testing framework I wrote called Lambda Behave, which is on GitHub. You can write your own functional interfaces which throw checked exceptions and then the framework can kind of manage that and then it's not a problem. So it depends on the, on the use case. Okay. Okay, we're basically running up for lunch. Uh, next session in this uh, room will be at one o'clock, which will be Mark Reinhold. Uh, we'll talk about Java 9, make way for modules. But before that, we'll have lunch and we'll give Raul Gabriel and Richard a big hand and thanks for this presentation. Thank you very much. I remind you to please go and fill out the forms of evaluation why you still got this presentation fresh in mind.